Great. So again, my name is Jordan Thomas, and I'm from um, Arlene Lake University from the Sigma chapter. And today I'll be presenting my NIH grant proposal, The Mechanism of the Cycle of Abuse. So before I get into the bulk of my presentation, let me first outline what I'm going to be talking about. First, I'm going to be talking about child abuse and neglect, and some of the stats over it and the long-term effect it has on children. Then I'll be talking about the cycle of abuse, what it is and why it's important, and what we know so far. Then I'm going to transition and talk about the types of maternal responses. Then I'll talk about the neuroscience behind these maternal responses, specifically the medial preoptic area, or MPOA, Mesolympic pathway. And lastly, I'll talk about the purpose and specific aim of my parent model. So let's continue. So child abuse and neglect. The Children's Bureau reported in 2014 that on average, 700,000 children are abused and or neglected in the U.S. alone. With 75% 75 75 being neglected, either like physically, not getting enough food, or emotionally, 17% being abused, physically abused, and 8% being sexually abused. The long-term effects for all of these are the same where they can cause a higher rate of psychological disorders, such as major depressive disorder or general, generalized anxiety, or even PTSD. But these children also have a harder time in society. They can't form adequate bonds, or it's harder for them to form adequate bonds with their peers or anybody else. But the most alarming thing to me was that children who are abused or neglected are two to five times more likely to commit suicide than any other child. Two to five times, that's a, a huge amount compared to children who are not abused or neglected. So, in addition, people, some people think that a child that's abused or neglected is more likely to become an abusive parent themselves. So you can see in this diagram, if a parent abuses or neglects their child, their child has a higher rate or a, a higher rate of growing up to be an abusive parent or neglectful parent themselves. If they do become abusive or neglectful to their child, you can see how this creates this cycle where the, the parent will abuse or neglect their child, then they'll do the same to their children in the future, and so forth. So it creates this cycle that persists over multiple generations. And in fact, this has been shown in biomedical experiments with both rats and rhesus monkeys, where they are able to replicate this cycle through two generations. So not only is it just this idea that we have in society, it's actually been proven biologically to happen in experiments. So, but in order to study like child neglect and abuse, we first need to know okay, what are maternal behaviors or maternal responses. So there are two types. Automat autonomic maternal responses, which are, they're automatic. The mother does them uh, subconsciously. One example I've shown in this picture is nursing behavior. In rats, the pup or the baby rat will go up to the mother and start trying to get milk. And the mother will instantly recognize that and go, okay, let me start nurse these nursing behaviors and let me feed the baby. So that's a very automatic behavior. The mother does it automatically. She doesn't really need to think about it. However, Voluntary proactive maternal responses are very unconscious. The mother has to choose to do them. So it's kind of the opposite. And in this picture, which shows an example, is licking and grooming behavior in rats. So the mother has to choose to lick and groom the baby. So it's a very conscious decision. It's not the baby will come and the mother instantly does it. The mother has to choose to do it. So. Now that we know the two different, two different types of maternal responses, let's start getting into the neuroscience behind the, them, specifically the voluntary proactive maternal responses. So this is called, this is the medial preoptic area, or the MPOA, mesolimbic pathway. And this is a neural pathway in the brain that controls specifically the voluntary proactive maternal responses. And you can see this first box is the MPOA, and then from here on out, through the ventral segmental area and down, is a mesolimbic pathway. In this pathway, there's, there's three stimuli that will activate it. 
Oxytocin pumps stimuli through touch, smell, or hearing. And estrogen. Estrogen is the key component to this pathway. Estrogen is so important because when estrogen comes in, it will bind to the estrogen alpha receptors in the MPOA. Once these receptors are activated, it actually initiates, initiates the production of the oxytocin receptor. So it allows the MPOA to be activated by oxytocin. And this down the line causes this connection between the MPOA and the VTA to strengthen. So without this estrogen, the MPOA would no longer be able to respond to oxytocin and have a weaker connection between the MPOA and the VTA. So now let's start connecting this back to child abuse and child neglect. So I have two examples. Well, let's say that a pup or a baby rat receives a high rate of maternal responses from its mother. So that means that the mother rat was licking and grooming the baby at a high rate. If this happens, the gene for the estrogen alpha receptor is unmethylated. So the cell can go into the gene and make a lot of these receptors. So the more receptors we have, the more we can get stimulated by estrogen, which causes up upregulation of the oxytocin receptor, which down the line causes a strengthening of the MPOA VTA connection and the MPOA mesolimbic pathway. And the stronger this connection is, the higher the rate of maternal responses that will be produced by the pup or the baby when they have children of their own. So you can see there's a direct link from the maternal responses that the pup receives or the child receives and the rate of maternal responses they give to their children in the future. However, what if the pup or the baby did not receive a high rate of these maternal responses? What if they received a very low rate or the mother neglected them? Well, if this happens, then the gene for the estrogen alpha receptor is actually methylated. So the MPOA no longer has a high amount of these estrogen alpha receptors. So it can no longer respond to estrogen in the right way. And if it can't respond to estrogen, it can produce the oxytocin receptors in the MPOA. And this down the line causes a weak connection between the MPOA and VTA connection. And again, if this, connect, if this connection is weakened, then we have a, we can't produce a high rate of maternal responses anymore. So again, this example shows a direct link between if the pup or the baby rat is neglected by its mother, it will then do the same to its children in the future. However, so, so far, this is all known in previous research. The key thing that differs my proposal to anything else is that we don't know how this occurs through multiple generations. We've seen from one generation to the next, but not through multiple. So the purpose of my study is to investigate the role of the MPOA VTA connection strain and the degree of methylation of the estrogen alpha receptor gene on the cycle of abuse, specifically across three generations of rats. And that's the key thing, because that's what's missing so far. We know the role of the, the methylation of the estrogen alpha receptor gene and the connection strength between the MPOA and the VTA, but we don't know how to do these two things, how are they affected through multiple generations, not just one. So that's what sets my study different from others. So the way I want to re look at this is through three specific aims. The first one is to determine if different rates of voluntary proactive maternal responses performed by the dams or the mother rats affect the strength of the NPOA VTA connection in the pups or the baby rats. So basically, if the baby rat receives a high rate of maternal responses, does the connection between the MPOA and the VTA strengthen? Is there a positive correlation between these two? Next, my second specific aim is very similar. It's to determine if the rate of monetary proactive maternal responses performed by the dams affect the methylation of the estrogen alpha receptor gene in the pups. So again, this is kind of the same thing as the first one, but instead of looking at the connection between the MPOA and the VTA, I'm looking at the methylation patterns 
of the estrogen alpha receptor gene. So if the pup or the baby rat receives a high rate of these maternal responses from its mother, is there a negative correlation with methylation of the estrogen alpha receptor gene? My last specific game is the key. My, last, my third specific game is to determine if the pups with a weakened MPOA BTA connection and or a high, highly methylated estrogen alpha receptor gene produced by it. Low rates of well, sorry, will produce a low rate of voluntary proactive maternal responses to, towards their children. So, although these pups might receive a low rate of maternal responses from their mother, not only does this cause a weakening of the MPOA BTA connection and possibly a methyl uh, methylation of the estrogen alpha receptor gene, but the, do these two things then cause that baby rat? to have a low rate of maternal responses towards its children. So this is a specific game that will link the two generations or the, the next generation um, and see what the effect is between all these variables. So, in conclusion, so we talked about child abuse and neglect and how prevalent it is and the long-term effects. Then we talked about the cycle of abuse, what it is and why it's important and that it's been shown in laboratory experiments. Lastly, we talked about the types of maternal responses, because in order to study the cycle of abuse, we need to know okay, what is a maternal response. Then we talked about the neural pathway that controls these maternal responses, specifically the medial preoptic area, mesolimbic pathway, and the parts of it, why it's key that we need estrogen, the methylation of the estrogen alpha receptor gene in the MPOA, and the connection strength between the MPOA and the BTA. And lastly, we talked about the purpose and specific aims of my research. And that the key thing that separates my research to other research is that I want to look at these variables across not just one generation, but three generations and see, okay, how do these variables, how are these variables affected through multiple generations? So here are my references, and lastly, I'll just thank Sigma Data for letting me present today, and my, my mentor, Dr. Candice Sapata, for helping me write this grant and letting me perform this research. Thank you. In previous research, what they've seen is that the methylation occurs within the first couple weeks of development. So there's kind of this pattern in males and females that this gene starts being methylated or not. So just based on previous research, that's how I know. Are you going to include like, genetics in your like, research at all? Like, are you going to consider anything about them? Or? The, what do you mean about genetics? About <coughs> Like if the, if the methylation is passed on through generations? Yeah. In my research, probably not, just because previous research has shown that it's more nature, not uh, nurture, um, versus what I said earlier. And um, actually another study showed that, showed with rhesus monkeys, that this is actually caused by the, the environment that the baby's in, and not the um, genetics. It's not passed on. So just in terms of the lab techniques, is this a destructive to the animal measurement when you do the actual determinant? Does it involve the euthanized, uh, sorry, bi biology words, euthanization of the animal? Yes, it does. So, that, I'm sorry? So, so how does that help with measuring the different generations because you're essentially culling a generation somewhere? Mm -hmm. The key thing is the way I organize the experiments in this, this uh, study, is that the rats will be able to live for 128 days. The first 28 days is their development period where they're with their mother, and that's when I can perform a, a model for child neglect. But then, after 100 days, then I can let them mate and have children of their own. 
and then after that, those children they can develop them on their own. That's when I euthanize them. And you're talking about the fact that you're seeing effects from generations before and stuff. How do you know you're coming in with kind of a blank slate rat population? How do you know there's no prejudice from the ones you're bringing in for your generation zero or generation one? I'm not. In the very first generation, I'm going to use that model for child neglect. There's actually a handful of models for child neglect that will control the amount of neglect that they receive. And the, with the model I'm using right now, or the model I will be using, uh, is in order to stimulate or simulate child neglect, we actually will take the baby from the mother and separate them for a couple hours a day. So this will just simulate the child neglect. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Oh, is the MPOA BTA, is that just in rats, or is there the exact same in humans, or is it Yes, I know it's in, in recent monkeys it's the same mechanism. I believe in humans it might be. Um, right now I focus more on rats and in recent monkeys since that's the bulk of the research that's out there right now. Have you found any past research on um, drugs that can um, demethylate the ER oxygen to like, reverse suicidal abuse? I try to <laughs> look at different drugs, but I haven't seen any. Uh, in order to counteract the, this methylation pattern, one study actually showed that we can actually take a rat that's neglected and simulate these uh, looking and groom behavior by just using a paintbrush. So they'll get the rat and use a paintbrush, and that will actually get the, uh, stop this cycle. Any other questions? So what is your role in this research? Are you just starting to write it, or are you going to actually have time to go for it? Right now, this is just a proposal. What I wanted to do is take this research and possibly see if I can use it in graduate school. Because the time of grant I wrote it is called an F30 NIH grant. And that's for MD PhD students. So later on, I want to get into an MD PhD program and hand it, see if I can perform this research. I'm like, hey, I have this grant. I can apply for this grant and get funded, hopefully get funded for it. And if I do, then I'll be able to form, perform the research. Any other questions? Thank you.